All right, thanks for getting the doors. All right, we're ready to start. Hey everybody, I'm Frank Lesniak and I'm joined with Danny Stutz. We'll introduce ourselves in a second, but if you're here to learn about some data science stuff in PowerShell, you're in the right place. What I, I think we're most excited for about this talk, we're gonna go through a specific use case and that's interesting in and of itself, but I, I just think it's kind of neat to do data science stuff in PowerShell. It's not a common use case for PowerShell. It's you know typically when you think data science, uh, people will refer you to Python or maybe MATLAB if you're more of an academic. So that's, I, I think, if you take away nothing else, that's, that's a good takeaway from this session. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I've been in consulting almost 20 years. Um, I've been working with PowerShell since it came out, uh, although I don't really consider myself very good at PowerShell. For example, I've never written a module. Uh, don't, <laughs> don't spread that too, too widely, but that's true. Um, I've got some contact information up on the slide. If you want to scan a QR code and connect, I'd love to, love to connect with you all. Um, and uh, maybe one more fun fact before I pass the mic to Danny. Uh, I've got a talk in two weeks at MMS on building a passive aircraft radar. So, uh, you know, kind of a renaissance man in some ways with uh, technology stuff. <laughs> I like to have fun with it. All right, Danny. Yeah, no, thanks, Frank. So, hey, everyone, Danny Stutz. Um, also similar to Frank, I work with Frank. I've been in uh, IT consulting for about five years. Um, I mainly work in like the M365, Entra, Azure security space, as well as, you know, just pretty much automating anything with migrations and stuff. So, yeah. Um, one fun fact about me, if you have a mechanical keyboard and you kind of adapted to it during COVID like I did, <laughs> catch me outside after. We can talk about mechanical keyboards. It's like one of my favorite things that I own and <laughs> kind of one of my favorite hobbies that I've, that I've been on. So, yeah. Right on. And, um... Danny, I'll let you talk about sponsors. Yeah, just wanted to give a quick shout out to all our sponsors. Um, I know James had mentioned this yesterday, but it really wouldn't be possible to have these you know, types of events without the sponsors. So I just wanted to flash up the, uh, you know, thank you to our sponsors really quick, so. Yep, yeah. yeah. And um, we didn't really mention it, but we both work for West Monroe. Uh, we're really appreciative that we're here. You know, we spent work time uh, working on this conference talk today. We've got a bunch of West Monroe swag up front if anybody wants to grab a pen or a squishy ball to throw at somebody later. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of good stuff up here. Agenda. Awesome. Yeah. And so for the agenda today, really, um, so we'll start off, you know, going through some of the survey results. So we'll, we'll collect the survey results. And then during the demo, we'll actually go through the, the live analysis of all the responses. So kind of just introduce that. Um, we'll go through kind of the context, you know, level set on, you know, what kind of brought us here? What was the, um, you know, use cases that we had seen for it? And, you know, why do we you know, develop this process? Um, then we'll get into some more of the, the data science uh, type things around, you know, scrubbing the actual data and, you know, anonymizing it. How can we, you know, achieve that? And then we'll go into, you know, some of the more nitty gritty things around, you know, the open AI embeddings. Um, how do we cluster, you know, these embeddings? And then also, you know, the centroid um, around k-means clustering. This will all kind of make sense as we, you know, talk through it and provide you a little yeah. more context after. But, um, you know, that's kind of a high level agenda for now. Um, we'll go through getting the topic, and then we'll we'll do a quick code review and uh, demo following that. Yeah, if this doesn't make sense, that's expected. So just just stick with us; it it will. <laughs> so as the slide says, survey says, I'll, I'll, we'll leave this up for uh, about a minute or so. If you haven't already taken the survey, uh, we'd really appreciate it. We'll use the uh, you know results uh, for for live analysis, and I feel like most of you have already done it already. So appreciate that, but. Um, just want to leave this up for, for 30 seconds or so, just so everyone gets the opportunity to scan that. I'm going to cut you off. We're not going to take 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, you all have scanned this by now. If not, please do. And you can fill out the survey while we're talking. That's, that's totally fine. Um, okay, so I'm going to take the mic here and talk about you know, what it is we're trying to solve here. Um, you know, to be honest, uh, I started working on this about a year ago. Uh, not, not four years straight, but about a year ago, I started working on uh, analyzing text data. Um, and it's not easy. Does anybody have any uh, thoughts on why analyzing text data may be difficult? There's a lot of reasons. Shout it out if you do. We've got, we've got stickers up here. Um, you'll, you'll see who, who we got a sticker up here in a moment. But uh, typos, yeah. Thank you. Dialect differences, that's right. Yeah, uh, so Danny and I could be saying the same thing effectively. Uh, but because he grew up in Minnesota, I grew up in the Chicago area, we might phrase things slightly differently, even though it's the same idea. Yeah, use of acronyms, yep, that's a big one. Uh, we will talk about that a bit. Differences in languages, yeah, English versus Spanish or whatever, yep. <laughs> yeah, meme words or lead speak, yep, yep. Any others? Different writing method, handwriting you mean? Uh, 
Uh, okay, okay, different, yeah, different styles like Roman numerals versus, uh, you know, regular numbers is what you're saying. Right? Yeah, gotcha. Okay, I'm going to click us through. I think we got to most of these actually. Um, yeah, text data is inherently unstructured. You know, it's not something you can directly compare, uh, at least not in, not in the way that you might want to. Um, inconsistent from person to person. We covered a lot of these, right? Data privacy is maybe one we didn't talk about. And then context is another one. We'll come back to context. Uh, without context, it might be hard to understand or interpret an answer to something. Um, but just because it's difficult doesn't mean we don't need to do it. Some examples of reasons you might need to do some text analysis are survey responses. That's certainly what uh, got me started on this initially and what I pulled Danny in to help me with. Um, you know, if you, if you work in IT, you might need to analyze service desk tickets. Uh, what, the, what was the nature of the ticket? How pissed off is the person? That sort of thing. Um, if you're um, out in the product space, you might need to look at restaurant or product reviews. Uh, or maybe you want to go to a restaurant. It might be helpful to analyze what's out there in terms of those reviews. And I'm sure there's other use cases too that Danny and I haven't even thought of. Um, just, I, I always think it's a good thought exercise when you're, when you're going to automate something to think about how you might do it manually, right? So this is an example of me trying to think through, uh, I guess like some, some manual curation of some of the, uh, some, some, some survey results. This is all contrived, but uh, you, know, you can see how I might've looked at the survey re response and translate that into more of a summary. And because I'm doing the translation, I can standardize the way I'm translating it and maybe group things together in sort of a manual way. It's not perfect, and it, you know, this is an automation conference, so we don't like doing things manually. Um, now, with that being said, you know, we gave a little preview of this. Uh, I wanna just spend a second on like, what exactly are we trying to solve for in the demonstration that we're gonna uh, show today. And really, um, the main use case is comments on a survey. Um, so you, you all have hopefully filled out the survey that we've flashed up with the QR code. Um, we wanna be able to take those responses and not read hundreds of them. I mean, I'm sure there's not hundreds in this case, but if there's like 500 survey responses, um, we don't wanna spend hours or days looking through those and trying to you know, grab all the insights out of them. We wanna kind of bucketize those and then surface the key insights. That's really the main thing we're trying to solve for today. But you can apply the same kind of logic to pro product reviews or any other free text responses. We did a dry run of this at, at West Monroe and somebody commented like, aren't these all really the same effective problem? And like, yeah, they are, kind of. Uh, <laughs> it's all free form text data, right? Question response kind of stuff. Um, going back to context for a second, this is really important. Uh, and we've got examples on the slide that show this, but there's a pretty big difference between the same response, you know, with, without any context and then with some different context added. So just saying twice a week without any context, like, okay, who knows what that means, right? Versus how often you exercise twice a week. That's sort of a middling, like that's, that's not a bad response. Somebody's like getting exercise, that's probably pretty good, but maybe they should be exercising more, right? Like you might kind of have that sort of reaction to reading that. Uh, versus how often you want to quit your job twice a week. That's really bad, right? That's a very different response. So context can be very important, but there are some gotchas to that too, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then talking about data scrubbing and anonymization, uh, you know, when, when we think about how we're going to be doing this analysis, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit to solutioning here, but I, it's important to talk about this here. Um, we're going to be using some large language model APIs, specifically with OpenAI, and um, you know, there's, there's sort of two different flavors of that. There's Azure OpenAI, uh, you get a dedicated instance, right? So if you haven't looked into that, basically there's a duplicate of the OpenAI infrastructure made for you that you can access privately. So anything you submit doesn't get added to like the language model. Uh, it doesn't become public data. So that's good. There's not really any privacy concerns there. Uh, the only negative I can come up with that other than maybe price or cost is that sometimes the model availability might lag slightly. Um, now, for the things we're using today, that actually doesn't apply. Uh, today in 2024, uh, it, the, the models were the same. So that's a moot point today, but that could be an issue depending on that when, when you go to do this stuff. On the other hand, the public open AI APIs, you don't really have an expectation of privacy there, at least in my opinion. Um, the data you're submitted can be used for training, uh, training the model that is. So effectively, um, I would not put anything confidential there. Um, but you do get access to the freshest, best stuff in theory. Um, so because we're using OpenAI APIs, the public ones for this talk, um, we need a way to scrub the data. And it, you know, I think uh, if, if you're like Portly PowerShell guy here, um, by the way, this is our sticker. You'll see Portly PowerShell guy appearing several times in our talk. Uh, you know, he points out, hey, you wouldn't have to do this if you use the Azure OpenAI service. And he's correct. The honest truth for why we're not using that is because it didn't exist when I originally started working on this. So uh, it didn't make sense for us to pivot um, just based on the amount of time we had to prep for this talk. But it's a good option for sure. 
Um, and then, you know, we talked about acronyms earlier. Depending on what you're doing, jargon can also be an issue. And this quote actually is representative of a real response on an employee engagement survey at West Monroe. This means something to Danny and I, but you all probably have no clue what this means, and that's expected. Um, so we'd want to like standardize that language and, or transform that language in a way that hopefully it means something more to the large language model. At least that's my theory around it. Um, really what this is saying is everybody on Danny and my team is great, especially the consultants, the senior consultants, and the managers. That's basically what that's saying in regular English. Uh, without going uh, too much further, I just <laughs> we wanted to throw a disclaimer here that Danny and I are not data scientists. We don't have an educational or practitioner background other than preparing for this talk. So if any of you are data scientists, you can probably run circles around us and accept our apologies in advance. We're gonna do our best here. <laughs> okay, and then I've got a couple more before I hand the mic back to Danny. Um, so embeddings, uh, this is gonna be the first data science-y thing we, we do. Uh, embeddings are like, like the side size, they're like GPS coordinates. Um, think of it as you, you've got a block of text and embeddings tells the large language model like what that text represents. It's the best way I can describe it. So, you know, GPS coordinates, you've got three dimensions, X, Y, plus altitude. People tend to forget about altitude. But you've got those three dimensions with GPS coordinates. Instead of those three dimensions with a large language model, um, in this case, we have 3,072 dimensions, which is like impossible to visualize uh, or, or show in any kind of way. But there's that many dimensions or vectors to the, uh, the embeddings model that comes out. So, so you, you put in text, you get out numbers, if that makes sense, really simply. Um, just to note, we are embedding text in this example, but you can also embed images, and there's some use cases for that. We're not gonna get into that, but just I wanted to mention it in case you look into this yourselves. Um, and then, you know, if I kind of took a step back when we were putting these slides together, and the whole talk is really predicated on this idea that similar text or similar ideas, themes, all that stuff have similar embeddings. And, and I have no way to prove that because the embeddings model used by OpenAI is not public information. So I'm sure somebody at OpenAI has a spec on this, and it's known to them, but it's not public information. There's no way to really reverse engineer it. So we can't prove this, but it's a data science uh, construct, I guess, or data science principle that we are gonna assume is true for this talk. So thanks to the data, science, data scientists for establishing that, we're gonna assume that similar text is similar coordinates. Um, and then one more thing on embeddings, uh, they do cost money, not a lot of money. Uh, the model we're using costs 13 cents for every million tokens, and a, each word is typically two to four tokens. So you know you get a lot of bang for your buck here, but it's, nonetheless, it's not free. It does take money to generate them. It also takes time. We're gonna be talking to an API, so we're, we're making an API call for every bit of text that comes in. Um, and then we're also storing these on disk, which, uh, which takes disk space, and you'll see when I show some CSVs the pronounced size and disk difference. And there might be more efficient ways to do that, uh, like you know, storing it on a Cosmos database, for example, but we're, we're just doing a PowerShell demo here on disk, so keeping it a little more simple. I, I keep saying there's one more thing, there's one more thing. Uh, OpenAI is not the only game in town. Yeah, there are other uh, embeddings, uh, APIs available, and depending on the timing, uh, it seems like there's, there's, diff there's different ones favored by data scientists. Like when Danny and I talked to our data science team, they were recommending some alternatives actually over OpenAI, but since then op OpenAI came out with their uh, their model three, version three uh, model for embeddings, and that seems to be superior. So depending on the time um, you, you do this, uh, there might be other alternatives out there that you might wanna consider. Okay, over to Danny. Awesome, yeah, thanks Frank. So as Frank was talking about um, embeddings, they're effectively coordinates, they're GPS coordinates, right? There's a numerical representation for the text that we're analyzing, right? Um, and to you know effectively group um, you know, these embeddings together, or these, uh, the text together, right? We use a method called k-means clustering. Um, so k-means clustering is really just an algorithm that um, will basically iterate through um, the different, you know, data points. What you see right here on this visual kind of GIF is actually a nice representation of how it works, right? So the triangles are the centroid. We'll, we'll get into that in a second here. But what's really happening here is, right, what the, the k-means clustering does is it, you know, it starts at kind of a random data point for where it thinks the categories are, right? 
And as it kind of you know places these categories around or these you know um, centroids, it will move them around such that it's in the best position or what it thinks is the best position for um, you know a cluster of data, right? And so this is basically how you know the different comments and things that are related to each other are, are grouped together, right? Is is by using k-means clustering to, to really iterate through each data point and you know group it together, you know based on how far it is from a specific cluster. Um, or centroid. So, kind of moving on here. So, there are many other, you know, algorithms and methods to actually, you know, group and categorize this data or, you know, analyze it right. Um, the one that we heard most commonly from the data science team at West Monroe was uh, DB scan, so density based spatial clustering of applications of noise. Um, there's a few other here that are listed, but um, that's really all this is to say is that there. K-means clustering isn't the means to an end, right? There's other methods to, to, to cluster this data together. Yeah. Yep. As poorly PowerShell guy says, you know, why didn't we just you know, use DB scan or write our own method in C sharp or PowerShell? And well, to be honest, the main reason that we use K-means clustering was for convenience. <laughs> we there are, you know, there's tons of different you know, um, models and you know, algorithms that are available in like Python, but in PowerShell, right, um, we found it easiest to you know, use k-means clustering just because it's available you know, within PowerShell, pretty available. Not necessarily PowerShell, it's technically .NET, but <laughs> you know, for, for the sake of an example here, um, you know, that's really why we used it. So going back to what I was saying earlier around the centroid. So basically once we've you know, created the clusters and ha assigned you know, where the centroid is gonna be, that is really effectively the category. So each cluster has you know, a specific coordinate known as the centroid and all data points that are grouped around it um, are you know, belong to that centroid or to that category, right? Um, so it does a little bit of, basically that's what k-means does is it measures the distance from each of these data points to each of the clusters and sees you know, how close is it in relatedness, right? So say for example, like this data point here, right? It's super small, but um, it's, you know, it's, it seems like it's closest to, it could be uh, belonging to the purple cluster, it could be belonging to the orange one. Um, but you know, it's just based on the Euclidean distance, it's a linear algebra term, <laughs> between the, the data point and the, the centroid itself, and it's determined that it's actually closer to this category than the others, which is why I grouped it there. Danny, before you move on, I think just, I'm gonna take a second. Mm -hmm. You can see there's five clusters in this graphic, uh, in terms of the, you know, if you see the different color codings. But if you look at the, where the, where the, uh, where the points kind of converge and come together, I mean, it, it looks like there should be maybe more than I see. I see, I see five key groupings, but then also a, a lar large disbursement of other data points. So I think one thing that I just want to mention here about k-means clustering is you have to tell the algorithm how many clusters you want. So you have to sort of know something about the data set or you have to iterate through different uh, clustering activities to find the best one. And in this one, it almost looks like they should have picked a different number yeah. to me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so kind of moving along here, to, uh, I'll talk more about the centroid. So um, really, yeah, once we basically have you know the coordinates of, of the centroid, um, there should be an item that is closest to that centroid. What we call that is the, the most representative item of, of that uh, cluster or that topic, right? So in theory, really this, you know, this closest item should be the most representative as in it should, you know, um, you know kind of have the um, the idea around the category, you know, solidified, and it should be, you know, most related to it. Oops. That goes Oops. there. <laughs> yeah. That to side. Um, as poorly PowerShell guy says, you might be more confident if you listen to DB scan, and really by that is uh, what he's saying here is, you know, um, if we use DB scan, DB scan will automatically. Um, basically calculate the ideal number of clusters, you know, as you run it. And so that's, you know, one of the advantages of using another algorithm to cluster uh, the data is, you know, some have different features or, you know, how it actually, the implementation of the algorithm actually works. Um, kind of moving on to this more. Um, so we can, what we, you can do, you know, we can, you know, pull like the say, for example, the top five most representative items in the cluster. This would be the top like five, for example, comments that are most related to the topic, you know, that the cluster is uh, centered around. 
Yeah, so. the, the advantage of that is you, you remove maybe some bias, right? If you've got that most central item, that should theoretically be the best, uh, best comment that represents the cluster, but it could also have some subtext in there or some bias inherent in it. So, so sometimes it's beneficial to think about more than just that one item, and you can grab five items, for example. Yeah. Back over okay, to you, and, oh, it's back over to me. All right, mm -hmm. right on. So, um, so, so far we've effectively grouped similar ideas together, and we've found the most representative idea or ideas in that, in that group, right, or cluster. But we still haven't programmatically surfaced what the topic is, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get that key insight out of, that, out of each comment, right, or each, or each category. So the last thing we need to do is take that most representative comment or group of comments and ask ChatGPT for help by literally asking it, what is the, com what is the theme of this comment or, or comments? Um, and, and we'll show you the prompt we use for that, by the way. Uh, it's not perfect, but it does work. So we'll, we'll get into that. So just to kind of summarize, here's the end-to-end -end process. Uh, first, we want to add context to the data if necessary. So if you, if you look at your data set and the answers to the questions don't make sense on their own, you might want to essentially do a string concatenation and add the question in there. Hey, on a survey, I asked the following question, and the person gave the following response, for example. Um, so that's adding context. Removing any company-specific jargon or identifiable information. So a really simple example would be replacing West Monroe with Acne Company or something uh, if we were submitting uh, West Monroe data to the public API. Pulling down the embeddings for the data set from OpenAI. Uh, those are those coordinates we were talking about. And then we would use that local embeddings file, the CSV stored on disk, and perform k-means clustering on it, maybe iteratively if we want to change the number of clusters. So that's an option too. Finally, um, as part of that process, we would identify the most representative data points and submit those to ChatGPT to literally define the categories for each cluster. And then finally, I'll put that information to a, a kind of a CSV that gives us the, the insights we're looking for. So we'll show you all that. That's the end-to-end -end process. Um, so with that, we're going to start code review. Uh, we do have a QR code if anybody wants to access our GitHub repo. We put this live today. So if it's easier for you to follow um, online, uh, feel free to scan that and pull up the repo. I'll just give you five seconds, and I'm going to click ahead and start the code review. I think, Danny, you're up first, mm -hmm. right? No. Okay. All right. Yeah, so as Frank was talking about, context is really important when we're, you know, reaching out to AI and open AI and basically asking it, you know, a series of questions, right? Well, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Right. Um, so basically what we've done, at least with this initial script, is um, it adds context to the data set in terms of it will transform some of the fields, you know, for example, the question and the comment into, an, into a new field, you know, additional context, right? So we access, you know, we dynamically access the, the CSV column names through, through the script, basically, to pull that information out. And then we'll take that in and basically concatenate it into this, you know, text box right here, right? So this was specifically written for, you know, an employee engagement survey. Um, you could provide it with whatever context you would want. But basically, it's going to take in this que the question that we have inside of the inside of the CSV, and then also the comment, and put it in this format so that um, you know OpenAI or whatever LLM can better understand, you know, the the, the prompt that's being given. Um, we threw this slide up here because mainly there were a lot of things we did along the way in PowerShell that we thought were very cool. However, you know, unfortunately we only have 45 minutes for this talk, so we're not gonna go over all of them, but if you wanna talk about any of this, you know, after our, our talk, then definitely feel free to, you know, talk to us outside and we'll-, we'll I, we're, I think we're doing a lightning demo on some of this, so mm -hmm. and we'll try and go through it as quickly as we can. Yeah. Moving on here to um, the anonymizer or the remover jargon script. Basically, this script is a simple way to find and replace, you know, specific data inside of, you know, a CSV file. It's nothing, honestly, super complicated, right? So, it's, for example, we have West Monroe becomes acting act company, as, as Frank said. And here's kind of an example of, you know, our, um, you know, case sensitive words um, replacement. As you can see, it's just really simply like find and replace effectively, you know, going through and iterating through the CSV and replacing it with, you know, the, the, the specific word or the, the full word that you want to replace it with. Right? Yeah, I notice most of this is jargon, right? Or de-jargonization. Mm -hmm. It's not as much. There's, there's obviously some removal of West Monroe, and et cetera, but mostly we're getting rid of jargon here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Same thing for, for case insensitive words, right? So, so that's something to know that's a little interesting, right? Is you, when you're, you know, finding and replacing words, right? You have to be very specific about, you know, the casing of, of the word that you're trying to find, right? So that if you, you know, you, for example, you're trying to find, you know, ERG, if it's tagged at the end of a word, right? Like ERG is at the end of a word, you don't want to replace that, right? So it's important to have, you know, capitalization and uh, sensitivity for yeah, that. Yeah, and just going back for one second, this shared services example shows that, mm -hmm. right? Um, exactly. Like for that one, we'd want to use a case sensitive replacement because we would not want Compass team to get messed up as you see on the example. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, that would mean. Okay, yeah. So, so, uh, so we've done some basic data scrubbing and context establishment. That's all pretty simple PowerShell. Um, Getting into some more simple PowerShell, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get the embeddings using OpenAI. This is a simple API call. If you've done any work with a, uh, a, APIs in PowerShell, there's not much going on here. Basically, we're getting an authentication header and we're building a JSON request body. This is all pretty well documented, uh, both in official OpenAI documentation and in various blogs on the internet. So you won't have any trouble doing this. Um, I guess the, the thing to point out is uh, the input uh, property in the JSON request is the, uh, that's the thing we're getting in the embeddings for. And we set a temperature, which is basically, um, I guess how stoned is, is ChatGPT? How stoned do we want ChatGPT to be? Zero meaning totally sober, one meaning uh, it's been uh, using some illegal substances. Um, but then we, do, then we do invoke Rust method, get the embeddings, and it's pretty straightforward from there. Um, Oh, and uh, you know, while, while we're showing uh, the model as a parameter, uh, we actually have it hard-coded in sort of a wrapper script to make this uh, a little more straightforward to, to uh, write code for. So if you go look at the code, you'll see that. Uh, and then as Portly PowerShell guy points out, we might be in trouble calling an internet API from a conference, uh, but um, one, one more kind of piece of goodie is we've set up some automatic retries with error handling, basically with recursion. Uh, we have a, a, a function that will basically check for um, both uh, terminating and non-terminating errors on, on anything that function's doing, as well as essentially an empty result. And if it detects any of those conditions, it will recall itself up to a certain number of times. So uh, I, I wish I would to knock on, but knock on wood, uh, we hopefully are good for the demo here today. Um, a couple other goodies that we built in is a check for missing PowerShell modules, uh, and the script will provide a helpful installation command. Uh, to be honest with you, I intend to provide this capability to our, some folks in our HR team. And uh, I don't want to become you know, their support resource exactly, so it, I tried to make it as user-friendly as I could. We're also checking to make sure modules are up to date, so, um, so there's that too. Uh, but as Portly PowerShell Guy points out, you don't need modules to call an API, that is true. However, we are also using the secrets, secret management module to uh, securely store and retrieve the OpenAI API key from Azure Key Vault. So again, if you've used this, it's not super novel, um, but for Danny and I, it was a good exercise to work through, and you'll see the code for that in our scripts. So then we get into doing the k-means clustering, and I, actually, yeah, this is the part, to be honest with you, that I think I'm most excited about and is maybe the most interesting from a pure PowerShell perspective. Um, we're going to be using the accord.net NuGet package. Uh, NuGet packages are kind of like PowerShell, uh, PowerShell-y in a way. Uh, they're kind of like modules in a way. You can pull them down from the internet and use them. And PowerShell has some capability to do this, but it's a little, it's a little difficult. I'll get into that in a second, but poorly PowerShell guy wants to point out that Accord.net is end of life, yet we continue to use it. Well, that's true. Uh, uh, there is there is a uh, Microsoft machine learning NuGet library that is actively maintained and probably a better option for modern development, I would agree. However, uh, we decided to stick with Accord.net because, um, well, in addition to the two reasons on the slide, first of all, that was what I was already using when I wrote some code a year ago, uh, but we, we decided to stick with it because it's um, backward compatible with uh, good old .NET Framework 4.x, so like 4.5, et cetera, uh, as well as .NET Standard 2.0. So for that, with, for us, what that means is we can use this NuGet package with both Windows PowerShell 5.1, think of that HR person use case, right? I don't want to make them install PowerShell 7, right? So they can use PowerShell on their Windows box, as well as PowerShell 7, the new, the new stuff. So it works with both. So that's kind of convenient. Um, and and this, there are a lot of goodies in the script. Uh, we split springs without using regex. Uh, so we, I have a function wrapper that does a, a, a split string on literal string um, just because I'm lazy and I suck at regex. <laughs> so uh, so po poorly PowerShell guy feels bad for me. Um, and then uh, uh, this is, I think, the coolest part here is um, we've got some, some functions that make uh, pulling down NuGet packages a lot easier. So first of all, we check to make sure NuGet.org is registered as a package provider. This is like the PowerShell gallery to draw an analogy. Right, PowerShell gallery is registered PowerShell Gallery is registered by default, 
on, on, uh, in PowerShell, but NuGet.org is not registered by default. So you have to do something to, to register it. Um, then we check to see if a NuGet package is, is quote, installed, uh, or basically downloaded and staged, downloaded and unzipped. Um, and it gives you a warning message if it isn't with, an, with a command to go ahead and install it. Um, and then maybe the, if, you've any, if any of you have worked with NuGet packages, um, they're a little hairy to work with because they get staged into a sort of a folder in your user profile, which varies cross-platform. And in addition to that, for all the different versions of .NET that that NuGet package supports, there's going to be subfolders and then subfolders for the version, et cetera. And it, just getting, getting the path to the DLL that you're going to load is a little tricky. So we wrote some wrapper functions that make that easy, and I think that's kind of neat. Um, so once you have the DLL path, we simply load the DLL using add type. Uh, there's a couple other ways to do this too, but that's what we used. Um, and then um, you know, when we, I'll, I'll show you how we, uh, how we did the k-means clustering in a second. But like I said, you, you need to have the number of clusters determined before you do the k-means clustering. So um, you see the to-do there for dynamically setting the number of clusters. We'll get into that in a second. But for now, what we're at least doing, it's, this is an available parameter. So if you want to specify the number of clusters, you can definitely do that when you call the script. But if you omit that parameter, uh, what, what the script will do is basically get the square root of the number of items, round it up, and use that number. So if there's 500 responses, I think the square root comes out to 23, basically. So that's what it would use, just as a best guess. And depending on your data set, that could be an OK guess or maybe a terrible guess. It really just depends. So you have to look at the results and decide. Um, going back to the to-do item, uh, there are algorithms to um, sort of optimize the number of clusters. Uh, specifically, the elbow method is probably the best known of those. Um, Danny and I are not data scientists. Uh, and while we've looked into this and broadly understand it, we haven't implemented it yet. Um, so hopefully we, we will do that at some point, especially if there's interest in this. Um, but uh, you know, just note that that's not quite implemented yet. Um, and then, you know, I guess this this basically shows you how we do the k-means clustering. I, I think the syntax is very weird, but I guess the key point here, if you don't already know this, is because we've loaded the .NET DLL into memory, we can access those objects afforded by that DLL, just like we we do any other object. And actually, I sort of glossed over this, but we load up, we load four DLLs, I think, for all the different Accord packages we need. But um, this is the syntax to, to do the k-means clustering. So we, we load the, the type and tell it how many clusters. We tell it to learn the embeddings, and then we tell it to decide the embeddings, which gives us the, um, uh, basically the assignment of a cluster to each, to each item on our list. So if there's 500 items, we'd get an array that lists the cluster number that each item is assigned to as a result of that. And then we can dig in and get information on the centroid, et cetera. You'll see that in the code if you look at it. OK, I guess, oh, sorry. We've got a, we've got a small thing related to the, the cluster here. So, um, so the next thing we do after we get the centroid information and we know which cluster each item is assigned to, we need to get the, the Euclidean distance. Danny mentioned this earlier. Uh, it's, but without getting into the details too much, it's basically the distance between two points on a map. Um, because what we want to do is sort the clustered items. So if everything in cluster number one, right, we want to sort those by distance to the centroid so that the closest items to the centroid are first, and then we can kind of use those as our most representative items. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, the final script in our process is to get the topic, right? We talked about that, right? So uh, this is going to be, again, a simple API call because we're going to hit the OpenAI uh, chat uh, API. So this, it looks like this. Uh, we, again, get a authorization header, uh, authorization, um, yeah, authorization header, and we, we build our messages. Uh, it's a little different because you have to tell ChatGPT what its role is. Um, we tell it it's a large language model by OpenAI, but you can get kind of silly with this and tell it, I don't know, it's a wizard in, in, a, in a Harry Potter book or something. You can get really silly with uh, what, what role you give um, ChatGPT. And then we, we provide it the, um, the content on the bottom as the user, which is basically the prompt. I'll show you the prompt in a second. And then we submit that using uh, invoke REST method. So not particularly novel, typical API stuff. Um, one thing that made this a lot simpler and we, is we don't need a conversation with OpenAI. Probably many of you have used ChatGPT and you can you know, kind of go back and forth and ask questions and have a conversation. We don't need to do that. We're going to ask one question and get one answer. So that does make this exchange a lot easier and simplifies our code quite a bit. Um, so this is an example prompt. Uh, this isn't perfect, but in something that, that could be tweaked. Um, but uh, this, this would work. So this is what we do. So we say, in as few words as possible, certainly no more than one to three words because ChatGPT is a line stepper and will tell me, even if I say, 
uh, if I say one to three words, sometimes it tells me five. I just, I, sometimes I don't, I don't understand this, <laughs> this, uh, this product, but it, that's what it does. Describe the topic, main idea, or theme of the following five texts, treated as a set. Each text is separated by three forward slashes. And then we list them out with three forward slashes separating them. Or if there's three forward slashes in the text data, I've, we've got an algorithm to dynamically select something else. Um, and then here we do the automatic retry logic again, that automatic recursion I was talking about, that's here as well. So if, um, if we get a terminating or non-terminating error uh, or a non-result, uh, it will detect that as an error and, and retry. So hopefully, knock on wood, uh, internet gods are with us, et cetera, and we will not get screwed up. So with that, we're into the demo here, Danny. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna alt tab over. Uh, so Danny has sent me the Microsoft Forms results. I'm gonna go ahead and download these and uh, I'm gonna move them into a working folder here. It looks like we got 17 responses, including uh, Danny and myself earlier. So I'm gonna paste that file here. I'm gonna grab the name of the file. Okay. Go over to VS Code. I just have a quick little demo script here to make this a little easier. So I'm just gonna change the name of the file and save that. And uh, the first thing we're gonna do is, um, you know, I'm gonna kill this. Oops, I did not mean to do that, sorry. Ah, sorry folks, this is me not having a real mouse. There we go, okay. All right. Well, Frank gets that set up. Everyone gets a sticker. Thank you all for coming, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, we, we printed some portly PowerShell guys stickers. All right. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do, I, I, I mentioned this briefly, but it's uh, um, we got the, uh, the results from Microsoft Forms. They're in Excel format, and if anybody's, actually I should just open that up and show you what the format looks like. Uh, the format of this file is um, each response, each person is on a line, and their answers to the questions are in columns, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that format. However, it's not the format that our script expects. The script expects question answer. So each, each question and answer should be on its own line uh, for, for our script to work. That's just how it's designed because that's how, that's how the data set I was originally working with was. So we need to convert this and, and, and flip it around. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. So that's what this initial code here does. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and run that. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like as we flipped it on its head. So open that Excel real quick here. So um, you can see person one, which I think was me, based on the timing, um, you know, wrote wrote four answers and to, you know to four different questions, and those are each on their own line. So you can see how we've sort of flipped that or did a done kind of a transpose on that. So now it's in the right format for us to uh, to proceed. Danny mentioned this earlier, but I just wanted to mention that you know the column names are not hard coded. There you can specify the column names as parameters. So don't feel like you need to open your data set and like rename columns and stuff, like that's not strictly necessary. So um, we're gonna go and run the next bit here. Oh, uh, sorry, one more thing. We're gonna skip adding context to the data set. I'm gonna, we asked more complicated questions that weren't just simple yes, no questions. So I don't think there's gonna be kind of simple answers that require context to be added. And Danny, actually, Danny and I actually found that when you add context and it's not necessary to do so, it actually messes up, messes up the clustering a little bit. You start getting items that are not really that related, getting clustered together, which we don't want. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip that here. We're also gonna skip the anonymization and dejargonization, if that's even a word, because we don't need to, and I, you guys might have used jargon, that's okay. We're all PowerShell friends here together, and I don't really care for the purpose of this demo. Um, so the next thing we're gonna do is get those embeddings or those coordinates. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And this should be pretty silent, um, but you can see I'm, I'm giving it um, information about my Entra ID tenant and my subscription and my key vault and my secret. And you know, if I would have ran this for the first time, I ran it earlier and probably should have restarted VS Code, it, it'll prompt my browser and make me authenticate to Azure. Um, but in this case, I'm already authenticated. I did MFA and all that and we're rocking and rolling. So that just finished up. And let me show you what that looks like. First of all, um, I know it's a little small, but you probably can see that the file size has jumped quite a bit because we wrote all of those coordinates or numbers to a CSV. So we've basically made them strings, which is not a very efficient way to store this data. Go use Cosmos DB if you're doing this at scale. Um, but let me just show you what this looks like if I open it in Excel. It's a little comical because there's so many numbers that it's word wrapped or line wrapped uh, in Excel. So you can't really even view this. And I, I think it was 3,072 of these 
numbers associated with each piece of text. So it's, it's a pretty meaty uh, transformation we just did, I guess. So not super useful to us humans, but will be very useful to, to the k-means clustering algorithm. So next, we're going to go ahead and cluster these responses. Um, I have not specified a number of clusters here, so it's going to use the square root of, what do we have, 17 responses? Okay, so 17 times four, there's four questions, and you know, because we, we blew those out into their own lines. So whatever the square root of that is, is what it's going to use. Um, so I'm gonna run that. And you see that didn't take very long. Uh, we, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a, but this is not a big data set, and I'm on a lower powered computer. This is actually an ARM 64 laptop, so it doesn't have a lot of horsepower. Um, not that ARM doesn't have horsepower, but this one does, is fanless, so it doesn't have much. And that didn't take very long. So it went ahead and did the clustering. Um, the output here is not super user friendly. It's going to be just basically numerical indices into each cluster. So this is telling me I have nine clusters. So nine must have been the square root of, uh, uh, what, 17 times four. Sorry, math is not my strong suit today. Um, and it's saying that you know the most representative item uh, for the first one is item number eight. So if I were to go back to the, the um, blown out CSV that I created initially, the eighth item is gonna be the most representative. And then I've got the top five um, items for each cluster listed as well as the full set as needed. So again, we got something we can go back and kind of cross reference, but this isn't super user friendly. Uh, so the next thing we're gonna do is run the last script which gets the topic and also goes ahead and looks up those comments and pulls them into the output file. So we can view this a little bit more easily. So oops, I'm gonna run that next. And this is gonna be asking ChatGPT, hey, what's the topic of this data set? Um, we actually have it asking for the topic for both the uh, most representative item, the single item, as well as the set of five or so. And you'll see there's some interesting differences sometimes when you, when you do that. So now we've got a separate file here and I'm gonna open that up. So um, again, I can kind of see, you know, I still have those um, indices here and all that and I can see how many items are in the set, but we've specifically blown out the, um, the alleged topic. It's so like here, look at this one. Remember I said no more than one of three words. <laughs> look how many words this is. Uh, oh, I guess there was a blank item there. Sorry, I, that makes sense that it, it did that. Um, probably this is somebody who skipped question two because it was optional. Um, so that's fair, I guess. But anyway, uh, you'll see that it sometimes um, line steps as I mentioned. So we, we get to see what the most representative item is for the cluster and um, and we get to see you know, the topic for each of these. So just take a second look at those. The first one is LLMs and coding evolution. That's cool. It's a good networking. Um, improved productivity, we've got a blank here, so we'll skip that. Skill development, data-driven enhancement. Emoji usage, that's kind of a bad one, right? Like I, I wrote, I'm speaking in smiley face, and it, <laughs> it said emojis usage was the uh, topic. It's a little silly. Um, but that might be one where context would be helpful, because I'm speaking doesn't really mean anything, if, unless you understand that I'm speaking at a conference. Uh, strategic delay, slow down every Microsoft product groups, so have my telephones, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, how to get away from all the people. So the, I, I, I mentioned to some of you, uh, you know, please go ahead and uh, insert some comical responses. So we're seeing a little of that, that's awesome. Um, so then we, then we asked uh, ChatGPT for the topic for uh, you know, a larger number of items, the top five items if there were five items in the cluster or fewer if there was fewer. So um, just trying to expand this column a little bit. Sorry, I'm working with my touchpad here. Um, so we can see, first of all, let, let's compare column F to column H. And you can see they're slightly different, right? Um, here it's LLMs and coding evolution. Here it's PowerShell and AI integration. Here it's, this is pretty similar, networking and learning versus networking event. That's pretty similar. Productivity and improvement versus automation benefits, pretty similar. Uh, this, is, this is effectively an ignore item. Um, skill development versus learning and networking, pretty similar. Now you can see we're starting to get some some clusters that are similar. So you might conclude if you're looking at this that there's too many clusters and you should maybe run this again with fewer clusters. Uh, Data-driven enhancement versus AI enhancement, pretty similar to AI integration up here. So again, another reason we might have too many clusters. Um, public speaking, uh, speaker, so yeah, it's a group two people together there that both said speaker and that's, uh, that's, that makes more sense. Delayed productivity, uh, is this, there's two, yeah, lazy developments. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so that's, a, that's another one. And then solitude seeking, there's only one in this item, so this is gonna be the same. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the output here. It's not perfect, but it does, this is something I can 
pick up and kind of put into a slide and show to management of, hey, here are the key themes for all of the survey responses we just did. Um, and I think that's more interesting than me going through every single comment and maybe introducing my own bias in the ones I pick out to show. So I hope you might agree that this is somewhat novel and interesting. Uh, I certainly think it is. Danny, did I miss anything? No, I think that's really it. I mean, yeah, I mean, that was, uh, no, I think you covered everything, Frank, honestly. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, I know, I, I, how many of you have been using ChatGPT to like generate your, your scripts, or at least generate some of it? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right, so I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, as LLMs continue to evolve and as, you know, ChatGPT continues to evolve, we'll find more use cases for this, or especially within PowerShell, right? I think it's, we're kind of just getting started in terms of like how far, you know, this can go at least. Um, but I, hopefully this was, you know, an interesting use case around, you know, some of the data analysis and the, some of the data, you know, um, kind of categorization you can do at least within PowerShell, you know, as opposed to using Python or anything like that. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Python, boo, this is PowerShell. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, any questions, guys? Before, I know we're at time, but just want to give an opportunity for that. We're also going to stick around afterwards, but anything immediate that anybody wants to ask while we're here together? Okay, all right, last thing, um, please take the survey, and thank you all. <laughs>